to Inside South Asia. I'm Bhairvi Singh. Those were glimpses of India's first lossless track made for the bullet trains shared by the Indian Railway Minister Ashwini Vaishnav. Now, the bullet train is all set to start operating in 2026 and will ply between the Indian cities of Mumbai and Ahmedabad. We have a packed show for you. Here's a look at what else is making headlines. First up on the show, the Pakistan Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif has his task cut out as he plans to visit China. Beijing wants complete protection for Chinese workers operating in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunwa regions of Pakistan and on its strategically important China-Pakistan economic corridor. This as Pakistan saw three attacks on China-related infrastructure projects and its military installations this week. The latest killed five Chinese nationals. Three attacks in a span of a week, all on strategic infrastructure projects linked to the Chinese or Pakistan military, demonstrating Pak's vulnerabilities on Tuesday, five Chinese workers and their driver were killed in a bomb blast in the country's northwest. A bomber rammed a vehicle into the workers' convoy as it travelled from Islamabad to the Dasu Dam, the country's largest hydropower project in Khyber Pakhtunwa. As a result, the Chinese company has decided to halt the work on the project. This is not the first time the Dasu Dam has been attacked. In 2021, a blast on a bus killed 13 people. Beijing is asking for accountability, calling for Islamabad to speed up investigations. China has poured billions into infra projects in Pakistan, many part of the CPEC, and thousands of Chinese nationals work on these projects. We have been in close contact with Pakistan, asking them to expedite the urgent need to severely punish the perpetrators, comfort the deceased, and take effective measures to ensure the safety of Chinese people in Pakistan. Pakistan has been grappling with a surge of violence in the last year. Most of it, Pak has blamed on groups like the TTP emanating from Afghanistan. The Pakistani Taliban denied any involvement in Tuesday's blast. While the Chinese projects are mostly targeted by the ethnic militants who want Beijing out of mineral-rich Balochistan, they generally operate in the country's south and southwest, far from the site of Tuesday's attack in Khyber Pakhtunwa. Islamists mostly operate in Pakistan's northwest, the area where the convoy was attacked. Pak's interior minister, Mohsin Nakvi, vowed to deal with an iron hand with those behind the attack while the Prime Minister, Shehbaz Sharif, is expected to visit Beijing next week. The matter is likely to come up. Earlier in the week, a Pakistan naval airbase and a strategic port used by China in the southwest province of Balochistan were attacked. Militants attacked the naval base, killing at least one soldier, while five terrorists were killed too. The Baloch Liberation Army, the most prominent of several separatist groups in Balochistan province, claimed responsibility for the attacks on the naval airbase and a government complex outside the Chinese-funded strategic port of Gwadar. Pakistan is dithering amid economic turmoil. The latest string of attacks put a question on future projects from allies such as China. Pakistan Gwadar port, the deep water port, is key to the China-Pakistan economic corridor that also encompasses roads and energy projects and is part of Chinese President Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative. For China, the safety of its projects along the CPEC is non-negotiable. Pakistan has a tough task ahead.
World News Now from India and it's being called a major flashpoint between the ruling BJP and the opposition India bloc. Sitting Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has been in the Enforcement Directorate custody for a week now. And as per the latest ruling by the Special Court, he will remain in Enforcement Directorate custody till April 1st. Kejriwal on Wednesday had threatened to make some big revelations in the alleged liquor policy scam under which he has been arrested. Now, the courtroom saw angry verbal exchanges as the Delhi chief minister leveled some serious accusations against the central agency. The AAP leader said his name had only figured four times in 20,000 pages of the case document, accusing the ED of being a political tool by the ruling BJP. Arvind Kejriwal also suggested that the government witnesses had been coerced. The additional Solicitor General, S. V. Raju, appearing for the ED, said Kejriwal was playing to the galleries. The central agency has accused Kejriwal of being a key conspirator of the alleged multi-million dollar scam. Team Kejriwal's tussle with the center goes back months, with the Chief Minister snubbing nine summons from the Enforcement Directorate for questioning over the alleged money laundering charges. He and the political opposition have termed the misuse of the investigative agencies by the centre against state governments. The alleged scam itself has been a massive flashpoint between the centre and the New Delhi government. And not just him, well, two of Kejriwal's own ministers, Man Manisha Sodia and Sanjay Singh, have been arrested in the case and have been in jail for months. Condemnation from across the opposition bloc followed with the Kejriwal government issue, issue seen as a uniting factor for the India alliance ahead of the elections. The issue is seen as one with potentially strong bearings on the general elections as they get underway from the 19th of April. While well, facing ethnic and military violence at home, thousands of Rohingya refugees are making a perilous journey by sea in search of a better life. A boat with more than 150 people capsized off the coast of Indonesia this week, putting the spotlight once again on the horrors and the tragedies of an entire generation of Rohingya Muslims. A dinghy boat crowded with 151 people, men, women, children, at the mercy of the deep blue sea for miles and miles around them. <laughs> Tragedy of the kind that hit them was waiting to happen. The United Nations Refugee Agency says their boat capsized hours after it left Bangladeshi shores. They'd spent a full night at sea. Fishermen and rescue workers saved 75 people huddled on the boat's overturned hull. Six bodies washed up on shore at Aceh in Indonesia. Seventy more are missing or dead, including the fleeing Rohingya refugees and the boat's crew. During the evacuation of Rohingya victims who were on the capsized boat, we evacuated the victims according to National SAR protocols from unsafe to safe areas. In this case, from the scene of the accident to the pier of Mulaba port. Not the first such disaster, it won't be the last either. Not that that will put off more Rohingya looking for a better life. Indonesia doesn't promise refugee status, but they see it at least as a life of being treated as a human. Even among those rescued, there were many scarred for life. The nightmare doesn't end. It just takes on another dimension. There was one case, a child whose parents and siblings died. There was another case where the husband, wife and child died, also children whose mothers died. So there were several families who said their relatives had disappeared or died at sea. 
Some 740,000 Rohingya had fled Rakhine state in 2017. A nightmare as dark awaited them in refugee camps in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. And then on to newer and ongoing phases of the horror. Imagine if you are a Rohingya family with a young person or a young, a young Rohingya uh, man being forced to join the very military that is barraging your villages with these aerial attacks. The very military that committed genocide against your community, sending hundreds of thousands of Rohingya over the border into Bangladesh. I can't imagine anything as horrific as that kind of situation faced by, by, the, uh, by the Rohingya. UNHCR data says that more than 2,300 Rohingya arrived in Indonesia last year. That's more than the number that have crossed over in the last four years combined. In 2023, 569 Rohingya died or are missing as they tried to flee Bangladesh or Myanmar. That's the highest number since 2014. The numbers grow uglier. It's the devil on one side, the deep blue sea on the other. Literally. And well, if you wish to climb the Mount Everest, you require a new checklist that entails not just oxygen masks, hiking gear, food, but also poop bags. In a bid to tackle the mounting waste crisis and pollution on the Everest, the government says climbers need to bring their own excrement back down. Our next report has more on the latest regulations. A new year and some new rules. If you want to scale up the heights of Mount Everest this season, then be prepared to trek back down with your poop. Yes, you heard that right. In a bit to tackle pollution, climbers need to now bring the excrement down with them from any expedition to the world's highest peak. Because leaving it piling on the slopes is a far from sensitive or sensible idea. Worry not, authorities say they have come up with a solution that will make it a zero smell affair. Mountaineers will be given two poop bags, which can be used six times each. The bags contain chemicals to solidify the waste which will make it odorless. According to the Nepal Mountaineering Association, an estimated 1,200 people will be on the mountain this spring season, starting in April. You must be wondering, where do people pass their stool otherwise? At the base camp, climbers during their acclimatization use separate tents erected as toilets, with barrels underneath collecting the excreta. But once they begin the treacherous journey to Everest, things become more difficult. Digging a hole is an option in some locations. But where there is less snow, one has to go out in the open. At an altitude of 7,906 meters, this is South Col. The point serves as the base before climbers really strive for the Everest and Lhotse summits. And typically enough, the spot is also called an open toilet. Decades of commercial mountaineering have also turned the world's highest mountain into the world's highest rubbish dump. An increasing number of big spending climbers pay little attention to the ugly, and smelly footprint they leave behind. A 2020 paper estimated that there may be 50 tons of solid waste 
left on Everest in the last 60 years. Picture this. Last year, as soon as the route was opened, a Nepal army team moved in to clear waste dumped around the world's highest peak. Authorities are hoping to make Everest cleaner. Poop bag rules have been in use on Mount Denali, the highest peak in North America and the Antarctic as well. It's time now for Everest climbers to go through the stool test, or should we say, toilet training, pun intended. And now let's tell you what else is making news across South Asia. India has released the second tranche of rupees 500 crore or 60 million dollars to Bhutan for the development of infrastructure related to the Gyalsang project, an essential national initiative by the King of Bhutan. The Gyalsang project is designed to empower Bhutanese youth through comprehensive skill development. The fund release comes less than a week after Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi concluded his two-day state visit to Bhutan. Modi has assured Simfu of New Delhi's firm support in its quest for development and agreed to provide Rs 10,000 crore or $1.2 billion to the Himalayan nation over the next five years. The first tranche was released on January 28th, earlier this year. Sri Lankan Prime Minister Dinesh Gunavardhana met with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing on the 27th of March. This is the first visit by a Sri Lankan leader to Beijing after Colombo put a moratorium on recurring visits by Chinese research ships to Hambantota port due to India's security concerns. However, during the recent meeting, the Chinese president called for joint efforts on high-quality Belt and Road cooperation, particularly on two flagship projects, the port city, Colombo project, and the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. He also called on the two sides to deepen logistics, energy and industrial cooperation. India is keeping a close eye on the six-day visit of the Lankan Prime Minister as China's footprints continue to grow in the region. At home, the Lankan cabinet has approved an increase in the minimum wage by 40%. The revision of the minimum wage from 12,500 Sri Lankan rupees or $42 to 17,500 Sri Lankan rupees or $58 was approved by the cabinet to support people living in poverty. Under this, the national daily wage will also be increased by 200 rupees. Two years back, Sri Lanka's economy collapsed after its foreign exchange reserves dwindled to record lows triggering soaring inflation, currency depreciation and a default on its foreign debt. Helped by a $2.9 billion program from the International Monetary Fund, the island of 22 million people has seen its economy slowly stabilize with inflation reducing to 5.9% in February from a high of 70%. Taliban Supreme Leader Mullah Hibatullah Akhundzada has vowed to revive stoning women to death in public for crimes like adultery. According to Akhundzada, women's rights as advocated by the international community are against the Taliban's interpretation of Islamic Sharia. In a voice message aired on state TV, he said, You say it's a violation of women's rights when we stone them to death, but we will soon implement the punishment for adultery. We will flog women in public. We will stone them to death in public. Afghanistan State TV, now under Taliban control, broadcasts voice messages purporting to be from a Khandzada, who has never been seen in public aside from a few old portraits. He is believed to be based in southern Kandahar, the long-standing stronghold of the Taliban. Mumbai has overtaken Beijing as Asia's billionaire capital for the first time, and here is how. 
There are now more billionaires in Mumbai 603 square kilometer than there are in Beijing's over 16000 square kilometer. With 92 billionaires, the maximum city now ranks third globally after New York with 119 billionaires, followed by London with 97. Beijing hosts 91 billionaires. Mumbai has managed to overtake China's political and cultural capital because of the 26 new billionaires it has added in a year. Beijing in the same period has seen 18 erstwhile billionaires drop out of the list on a net basis. Mumbai's total billionaire wealth stands at 445 billion dollars with a 47% increase from the previous year, while Beijing's total billionaire wealth amounts to 265 billion dollars, a 28% increase. Well, this week also marked the 53rd anniversary of the Bangladesh Liberation War. Before we wrap up, here's a look at how the country marked the historic day. Thank you for watching Inside South Asia. I'm Bhairavi Singh signing off. They have sacrificed their life, Indian nationals, for our freedom. So, uh, our heads up to them, and we are really grateful.